All right, D Dante. D Dante, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Uh, from Compton, California. Uh, Bullets and Rosecrans areas. You know, probably pretty much known as Ludus Park. And back in the days, Ludus Park mob. What was your family like? I mean, <laughs> in a sense, uh, back then my family was was pretty much together. You know, they were pretty well kept together, Christian family. Well, uh, my mom's came from Mississippi. My uncles came from Mississippi or Chicago. Either way, it was in between. And um, the dirt roads to kill Michael, Mississippi, to be exact. Uh, and they came to California for a new life, like everybody else. You know, the South is the South is pretty rough. You know, they they want to come and get into a new world, so to say. Um, mom's is I, I believe she's the youngest out of the sisters. I got I got my uncles. And it was a real, how do you say, traditional black family from the South. You know, you had everybody went to church on the weekends. Um, cousins were in the military. I idolized my cousin Cornell growing up because he was he was that dude. He was that image. He was he was who I wanted to be like. Um, or either that or my stepdad. And my stepdad, he came from background of military. He did contract work. He built probably about. He partook in probably about building like three of the Marriott's in Palm Springs. Tall dude, older, about like 30 years older than my mom, I would later find out. And um, so we stayed together. But um, it, it was it was different for me. I guess at a young age, I was I was more so of an abstract to the normality of the people around me. Whereas a lot of other kids, they went and played football or they ran into these type of things. I tried it, but it wasn't really me. I was more into artwork and you know different type of dancing and and, and and those type of things and uh it got me in trouble my mouth got me in trouble a lot so you know my my mom would more so to speak whoop my ass a whole lot and uh <laughs> it, it worked at, at some point in time but as a kid gets, gets older he becomes you know tolerant to certain things so you just can't keep whooping a child as, as they grow older you know and um my mom was a, a tough cookie you know in this day and age now, I respect how she treated me. I respect the, the things that we went through because if I didn't go through it, I'd either be dead in the street, dead in prison, or, or, or dead in one of those group homes that they, that they had me in once they took me away. Um, let's see, it was, <laughs> it was always a controversy with her and my dad. You know, my dad, who's dead now, he died in about 2001. Took two bullets to the head and three to the back in Linwood, California standing out front of the same liquor store that he grew up in. And, you know, when my grandmother, who was sick with cancer, who's passed away now as well, she sent her, sent him to go live with a Hispanic family and he would work in the liquor store. And years later, after my grandmother had passed away, it, it you know, it, a man's mother has died. You know, this little boy lost his queen and he went back to the streets. He was outside and, you know, he, um, he was getting some formula for my sister standing out front and a guy came up to, you know, buy some dope or whatever. He's doing a little slanging. Um, and um, they get into a physical altercation. And my dad won. But this dude, Hispanic dude from the local, you know, Cholo hood or whatever, he ran around the corner and he came back and he caught my dad slipping. And that's when he murdered him. Open case, cold case, whatever you want to call it. You know, and that's, it is what it is. There was no more investigations that went into it or none of that. And I mean, let's look at it. Guy from Compton, California, black guy, statistic. We're expendable. And I'm really looking to that type of stuff. But as at a young age, I, I didn't know my father, really didn't know him. I knew my stepdad and he ruled with a iron fist. You know, you weren't even allowed to call him pops. You know, you call me daddy. You know, you go to work. I mean, you go to school, you get your schooling done. If there was a flaw on a progress report, he would have you by the time he got home. You know, he is go out there and get a switch. You know, discipline is, is coming right now. You're doing your homework. If, if there was a, a, a wrong mistake on there, you know you're supposed to have this right. And he had a handful of gold. Come here, put your head there, tap you right in the head. And um, I learned from, from him what hard work is. Because even after we were done with the homework, he would bring these buckets, big ass buckets of just wires, wires that he was getting from places, from the Marriott's and stuff. And it would be me, my mom, my sister, and my dad. And you're a razor, here. You fill up this trash can, you fill up this trash can, and I want it done by the end of the night. So it was just 
imprinted in me as a kid, like, all right, this is hard work. But at the end of that, you know, it was hurting my mother, the things that he was doing on the side, you know, just infidelity, cheating and all that type of stuff. You know, he's an old, old school Southern dude. You know, as long as I take care of the bills and the kids is fed, you know, no matter what I do out here in the streets. Um, and I'm like, all right, I'll come home. Mom be like, where is you at? Oh, I was at dad fixing a house over there. He was at his friend's house fixing some walls. That's what he told me to say. All right, he was over at his friend's house fixing some walls. And, you know, I'm in the kid, I'm in the room with, with, with you know, this lady's kids eating pizza. We having a party over here. So it's cool as long as I keep going around meeting my friends. You know, it was, it was he was such a savage with it that he had sex <laughs> with his best friend's wife at their kid's birthday party while I was there. And I, I walked in the room and, um, I had went home one day and he forgot to tell me, you know, you're a kid, he forgot to tell me, don't tell your mom. He forgot to give me the script. So when my mom asked, like, where did you go? Oh, I was at my, my dad took me over here to this lady house and he was in there, you know, laying with her and I was chilling outside and doing yada, yada, yada. And she found out and it, it, it devastated her, but she didn't leave. And I looked like this, this is weird. And like she didn't leave and um, she had jobs always been a nurse a little five foot five foot one dark skinned creole lady from mississippi lifting people up out of wheelchairs and taking care of them as a nurse real quiet you know my mom's still to this day quiet she keeps to herself and um one day she just said she had enough she she had enough and um she put me and my sister in the car and we drove down to long beach and um, we went to my auntie's house and we, we stayed there and she just said, nah, but before that, he <laughs> he tried to put sand in the gas tank. So you put sand in a woman's gas or anybody's gas tank and they're trying to drive from Palm Springs to Long Beach. It's going to be some issues with the car. And that's why I seen the first blow that my mother took, you know, the, the first blow to her, her confidence, her self-esteem, her dignity as a black woman, you know, or just a woman in general, because she she went to family members and she was like, you know, I just need this amount of money. Chump change, chump change. She said, I just need $300 so I can get my car fixed, so I can drive my kids around, you know, get the kids to where they need to go. And they shut the door on her. You know, your, your family shut the door on you. And I've I seen how it messed her up. And to this day, it still affects her because she don't go around like that. You know, she don't, she, she, she distanced herself. And sometimes distance is the best security. And, um, she just started doing things solo. We live with my auntie Mary, who's rest in peace now. Pillar, one of the great pillars of my family. Um, she's resting. And we live there, me, my mom, my sister in a room, all our clothes, everything goes in storage. The car is gone. And she started from the bottom working there. Um, eventually we will move out and get a place right around the corner. And I was in um, junior high school. Um, and around that time we had moved in there, I got the word that my stepfather had died driving from Palm Springs. And my cousin, the one that I idolized, was paralyzed, you know, essentially from, from the neck down in that car accident. He was destined to go do college, military, all that type of stuff. And he, uh, he was paralyzed in that accident. And my father died trying to swerve out the way of something, drinking and driving, as, you know, as usual. He would keep a... a, a, a <laughs> He would keep a, a igloo in the trunk and he would have a fifth of black velvet and he would have a two liter of Coke. And whenever his, his cup would empty, he'd get out and he'd go back there on the side of the road and he'll pour his drink, get back in. And I'd be like, Dad, you know, I want some of that soda. He'd be like, no, nah, this grown folk soda. I'm like, Dad, I want some of that soda. And he'd be like, well, here, boy, go ahead and have you a sip. You know, and that's that's where the drinking started from. He's seven years old. Pops gave me that first shot of Canadian whiskey. And it, from then on, I'm like, all right. And my cousins would give it to me because now they're like, oh, that's, you know, it's entertaining to watch this kid just dance around and, and be around us and look at him. We're not giving him a lot. No, we're going to give him just a little bit. He's going to get his dance on. He's going to fall asleep just like the grown folks. So I wanted to be around him and I felt like I was impressing him so I continued to do it. Moms would move around the corner and she got her first, first boyfriend. She got her first boyfriend and... Um, my sister would be allowed to go with her father. We had different dads. You know, this guy, you know, low riders, pulls up on motorcycles, you know, he got a house, kids, whole family and all that. And that's when 
the division started him at home because I, I began to envy my sister. You know, I envied my sister and Po Thang, she, she has a disability. I'm envying you when it's not your fault. It's, it's the adults. And I'm like, damn, you get to go spend time with your dad and I don't get to spend time with my dad. What did my dad do? You know, what's, what's, what's so bad about my dad where you get to always go over here? Why do they favor you? You know, he can't even bring clothes around. It's like, no, nah, you take your clothes, you get out of here, you know, and um. As time progressed, I, I just, I had a hatred in my heart for my sister because of that. You know, I, I, I disliked her. Um, my dad came around one time and I seen him, he showed up at the door and my mom shut the door right in his face. And then hatred for my mother began there. You know, they, like a real just, why are you taking this from me? Everybody else gets to have their father, but you take this away from me. You know, you, you, my stepdad's gone, you know, what the kids do, they blame their mothers, you took this. We could have stayed out there. You, you took my father away from me. You took the house. You took the cars. You took all this type of stuff. And, and I began to just live in that and become real quiet and resentful towards people. And um, my mom got her first boyfriend. And I, I met the dude and I seen him. Bigger fella. He's from Linwood. And uh, he came into the house and I was sitting there one day and I, was all, I would always watch him like a hawk. Like a hawk. And I cut my eyes and my mom, he used to tell my mom, that little boy keep cutting his eyes at me, I'm gonna fuck him up one day. I still cut my eyes at him. You know, he took me to his family house and I'm third grade by this time. I don't know how to read anything. I don't know any math, I don't know any reading. The little school that I did go to out there in Palm Springs, they just passed me through. You know, just, you're the rare black kid that we get, so we already think that you're stupid, so just send him on through. He might be an athlete one day. And, um, and this, this guy, he would try to teach me stuff, but I, I didn't respect it because I didn't feel like it was genuine. So I would talk back and I would, I would put up a fight and then you're not my dad. And, um, and then the way he would start to treat my mom, you know, he abused her kindness. He abused that Southern hospitality and she didn't notice it, you know, and she, she went down the path of, you know, essentially taking care of this dude. Um, and then things came along. My grandma would come and live with us at the time. She had lost both of her legs and she would live with my, my auntie before that, but diabetes and cataracts took a toll. And, you know, we, Rena C was the type of individual, you couldn't do anything wrong. You couldn't do a damn thing wrong. She would just look at you and say, it's all right, baby. Just do better next time. Even when she was blind, she went blind because the cataracts. Grandma, I want something to eat. Grandma being there blind, trying to make you a sweet potato pie. Cause she know that's what the baby's like. And, um, she had lost her legs and grandma would end up coming to live with us for a little bit after she left my auntie Mary's house with my uncle Danny. And um, I would see my mom carrying my grandma upstairs, like a whole flight of stairs because we didn't live on the bottom floor. We couldn't afford it. Those are the better apartments. So she would carry my grandma up the stairs, put her in a wheelchair, take her to the room, give her baths, take her to the park, take her to a, a hospital visit. And she didn't even have a car. So it was just a hustle and bustle. And I looked at this dude and he wasn't doing shit. You just sitting on your ass, just collecting everything. And um, I came home one day from being at my auntie's house and my mom was in the restroom. And I learned my first life lesson as a young boy where the world was turning him into a man. And um, he was drunk, he was banging on the walls, he was banging on the door. My mom was trying to shower. She was trying to take a bath and uh, from working at Long Beach Memorial. Um, he punched the door in, went through there, climbed through there, you know, snatched my mom up. She's like, what are you doing? He had her in the kitchen and he had, a, he had a knife to her. And I'm in the room with my auntie and my sister. We sharing a room, I mean, with my, my grandma and my sister, we're sharing a room. And I'm like, you know, I need to go. I need to go help my mom. I need to go. And that's my mama. I need to go. And no matter how much I feel about her, you're not going to touch her. How little I am, is there something in my heart to say I need to go fight for my mom. And, um... My grandma stopped me, she held my hand as strong as she could. And she said, nah, that's, that's, that's a grown folk thing right there. You need to, you know, you need to stay out of that. But I still tried and she said, no, you, you stay out of that. And um, he stayed there, dude left. My mom was there, mom, you all right? She said, go back in the room. I go back in the room and I'm like, nah, I, I need to do something. This don't feel right. And I, I went to school the next day and I had speech classes to help me learn how to read and you know do basic math uh, to speed me up. And I told my speech teacher, like, you know, this, this dude put his hands on my mom. Can't call my uncles, you know, they, I don't think they would have 
you know, done anything. Something in my mind said, don't, don't call them. You know, the trauma's already done. Y'all abandoned her when she couldn't even get a damn car. And um, said this dude did this to my mom and they came and got him, snatched him up. I guess he went to jail or whatever. Um, and when I had got home, I was like, y'all gonna be the hero. Like I saved my mom, I'm gonna be the hero. Yada, yada, yada. I was, I was pumped up like, yeah, mama, I'm, I'm, I'm that dude for you. And I got home and I got my ass whooped. And my mom told me, don't do that. Don't ever do that again. You stay out of grown folks business and you don't go to the police. Police not for us, they don't help us. That just created more problems. What did you do? You know, y'all, y'all kids, y'all do this and y'all do that. And I'm like, damn. And at that point in my head, everything altered. So we never go to the police after that. We never go talk to these people at the schools. We don't, we don't do that type of stuff. A man doesn't do that. You know, this is the family. And um, she would have just things happen. And my grandma ended up going back to Mississippi. She passed away a short time after that. Uh, a point came in where my auntie, my auntie Shadell, she was able to talk to my mom and I was able to finally just spend some time with my dad. And it was like, damn, this is, you know, this is a twin. This is, this is me. I'm talking about all the way. I see my sister's mom. I got seven sisters. I go and I, I see my, I see my sister's mom. They immediately grab my hands. They touch me. You got nails just like Mario. You talk like Mario. You walk like Mario. You, you, everything that did that, that your daddy was. And, um, I had about four visits with my dad, four visits. I met my grandma. I met my uncle Cheyenne. I was able to spend time with my, my aunties that came down from Chicago. And then after those, those, you know, four visits, it was like he came to say, hey, I'm him. You know, I'm gonna make this presence known. I'm your father. This is me. You know, um, and you know, the murder happened. Time progressed. <laughs> my, my heart became black and, you know, I went to school and I had friends and that's where the racial thing happened. I went to school for fourth grade, Jane Adams Elementary School, Long Beach, California. Had a friend named Sergio. Coolest dude in the world. We straight. Sergio had older brothers. And I guess his older brothers had an impact on his life to where it's, you know, best friends. Best friends. Hey, hey, let's go to the bathroom one day. And we, we go to the bathroom and I'm sitting in there and they're like, yeah, you know, some more Hispanic dudes come in. I'm like, you know, I don't know anything about gangs like that, you know. I, I see long East ESL hit up on the wall. I don't know that it's long. I'm talking about, you know, Eastern National Soccer League or something. I'm thinking like, what is this? What is this stuff written on the walls? And, you know, the gang life had already entered their family. You know, the racial thing had already entered their family. And um, at that moment in the bathroom, you know, the dudes turned the lights off on me. My best friend called, told me, you know, fuck my ates. And I got jumped by three Hispanic dudes with the lights off in the bathroom. And then after that, I was like, all right. It's war. Y'all, you put the line in the sand. It's just, it is what it is. I don't have to talk to y'all. Y'all don't have to talk to me. You say something disrespectful, I'm fighting from now on. I got to go home. My mama finna see this, see me all scarred up and stuff. And she's like, oh, what? You been getting in trouble in school? So now I can't get in trouble in school, but I am getting in trouble in school. I can't explain to you that the shit is going on in my life. You wouldn't understand. I don't think nobody can feel my pain. We think that as a kid. I thought that nobody understands this. They don't know what death is. They ain't seen this. They ain't going through that. And um, school became just a place I didn't want to be. I didn't feel like I was learning anything or it was just the fact that I couldn't learn. There was too much shit going on in my life. Left that, time progressed. Um, me and my sister, we started to bond more because mom was working a lot this lady was working a lot and I had to take up responsibilities because there was no real father figure in the household and I would clean up for my sister you know what I'm saying I would I would go to the schools and um walk her home um she had to go get pads you know I got to go in there to the store to get pads embarrassed everybody in the neighborhood laughing at me oh you're in there getting tampons I'm like I just want my sister you know whatever you know I'm cooking for her, ironing clothes we got to go to the laundry mat we doing that all the the typical shit you see in the hood mama putting stuff in your name and all that you know that that type of stuff came um but it would just be these sudden bursts of just anger that I received from from people you know and Time passed down the line and nobody really knew what the fuck was going on in my life. Excuse my French, I'm trying to get out of this, this cursing thing, trying to <laughs> expand my vernacular. Um, nobody really understood what was going on in our, in our household. You know, it's, 
the black community, Hispanic community. You know, you don't, you don't, we don't seek therapy. We don't do, we don't do psych meds. We don't go talk to people about the shit that we have going on. So it was, it was real tight kept. And um, as I got older, my tolerance for ass whoopings, like I say, became, I don't care about this. Mom, you could whoop on me. I'm already whooping in these streets. I'm fighting these dudes in the streets. I'm fighting these dudes at school. So this, this, I'm becoming tolerant to it. So I guess she felt that, you know, the need to take it a step higher. You know what I'm saying? All right, these, this belt ain't working, so this slap ain't working, so all right, now I gotta, I gotta really put this to you. And you know, it would, it would become these situations like, all right, you know, you get in trouble, I gotta give this to you. To this day, am I upset about it? Nah, I don't, I don't think so, because a lot of those, a lot of those things, you know, it, it would have saved my life, and it saved me from doing shit, because my intensity level was so high. And um, one day it just, <laughs> it wasn't even a one day, it was just a buildup. It was a buildup of going to Harbor View or Star View, which a lot of people may, may not know of. And um, they were doing these psychotropic things where they were just analyzing me and they told my mom, put him on meds. So she fell for it. I fell for it. 11, 10 years old, I'm on Zoloft, something that's supposed to be prescribed to an 18 year old. I'm on Respiradol, antipsychotics. My mom got to give you these meds. I'm running around sitting on my, my bed at home drooling and my mom's not figuring out, well, she's like, what is going on with my son? And she, she's heartbroken at the fact that she can't get through to me. His heart's blackened. He's hardened by the streets. He's going through these things in life, you know, can't go outside. My sister can't go outside just because my mom's not home. So we're just sitting in the house. You know, we, we just in this fucking cage. And um, I did something at school and I forgot what I did. And my mom just had that moment. She snapped, told me up, told me up. and um. The next day I had to be at school. She said, you know, you, you know, put this on, go to school. You know, what happened? You fell off a bike. Teachers been hip to this, you know, they've been hip to this. So I go in and on this particular day, it's the hottest damn day of the summertime. D. Dante, why are you in class with a full blown turtleneck on in the middle of the summertime, just sweating? And um, I'm like, I don't know. They send me to the Dean's office and the Dean is like, uh, What's going on with you, yada, yada, yada. I'm like, I'm good, I fell off my bike. He's like, I'm gonna call your mother and let him know that this, that, and the other if you don't tell me what happened and show me what's under your shirt. Uh, I pull my turtleneck down, pull the sleeves up, because I don't want them to call my mom. You know, you, you play the hand, play the, play the game in my mind there, he got it out of me. And um, they seen the bruises and they, they, they seen the marks and stuff like that and they were like, oh, no, nah. you know, that's, 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 we can't go for this. And I told him, you know, every kid gets whoopings. What do you mean? We, that's what y'all call the parents for when they messing up, you know, all right, he needs to be disciplined. That's what y'all doing. Um, at that time, that's, that's when, that's when life took a toll for its worst. They, they took me away from my mother. Took me straight out of school, Lindbergh Middle School. Um, I told him, you know, if you take me away from my mom, I'd rather die. I'll kill myself for you take me away from my mom's. Dug a hole even deeper. Next thing you know, they took me to some place, ambulance pulled up, they strapped me down to a gurney and they took me to Cerritos College Hospital. As um, soon as I got in the door, it was just, this is, this is a mental asylum. This is, this is where they send the crazy people. I'm not, I felt like I wasn't crazy. Like I just once said that I would rather die if you took me away from my mom. Um, ran a bunch of tests on me, put me on even more meds. They put me in groups and all this type of stuff. And, um, my mom came and they said, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not allowing your son to go back home to you. They took me away from my mom. The doctor said that, you know, he's such at a high risk with this depression and, you know, um, he's cutting on himself. You know, I carved help into my arm. He doesn't talk. He lashes out at people when they speak to him and other kids talk to him. Even when they put me in an isolation room, you know, other kids, they fight. Ah, ah, ah. And they're sticking them with that, you know, they call it booty juice, the tranquilizer. Kids are fighting, grown men fighting, and they're jumping on them, and they're sticking them in, the, in their asses with this, this trank and putting them in the, mood, in the room and sedating them. I'm asking them, hey, can you take me to the isolation room? And they have me in there, and they'll see me in there just swinging my feet on the end of the bed. And they ask me, why do you like to be in there? I say, it's peaceful. I feel safe. Nobody can get to me. And doctors just, they seen it, and it was, it was weird to them. Um, uh, I would get taken out of that hospital, placed with my, my, uh, my auntie, my auntie Mary and my uncle Dan, they, they took me and my sister in. Um, but before that it was, 
I was supposed to go to my auntie. I almost left that one out. <laughs> I was supposed to go to my auntie. Light this real quick. I'm supposed to go to my auntie and on the, the seventh day, you know, I have my hopes up. You know, kid has a hopes up. I'm, I'm in this crazy people place. Everybody's going home. They get visits on the weekend. And on the final day, I was supposed to go to my auntie to live with her until I went back to my mother. And they come and they say, you know, Dante, go down there to the collect phone and you have a, a phone call. And I pick up the phone and um, now I understand what she meant. But back then it was one of the most painfulest things that I had felt because I was anticipating something. I was anticipating the greatness. I was anticipating the happiness. And um, she got on the phone and she let me know that, you know, I, I can't take you. You know, my auntie couldn't take me. I was like, so where am I supposed to go? I was like, you know, you're going to go with your auntie Mary. You know, damn, I'm really looking forward to this. You know, like I'm here, I'm stuck, and I gotta wait an extra three days to get out of here. You know, and being at my Auntie Mary, she tried her best. She tried her best. I was just too lost. I was too gone. You know, these this was a this was a, a child that was molding and forming into something completely opposite of what they had seen. And um I went there, I lived with her, and it was just it was it was too much. I was I was a badass kid. Her kids were grown. You know, your son, your son is my cousin. He's in a wheelchair. He's going through what he's going through. I couldn't even talk to him. I never asked him to this day, like, was it the pain that you were going through of going through the accident that had you feeling the way that you felt towards the world? Or did you purposely have something ill intentioned towards me because of what my stepfather had did? And we've never talked about that to this day. And I was like, I gave him his distance because it's like, I don't. I don't know what what happened or what it is. And I lived in that and I continued and I got in trouble one day at school. And my auntie said, you know, it's Dante, you got to go. I'm tired of coming down here to this school. I'm tired of you doing this. I'm tired of you doing that. And um, they called my, my social worker, Gemma, Gemma. I said, Dante, I'm going to pick you up and take you to an emergency foster home. And I said, I don't want to go to a foster home. I don't. I, you told me I wouldn't go to a foster home. And she was like, well, you got to go. If not, you can go to jail. You want to go to LP? I said, you damn right. Take me to jail. I'm 12, take me to jail. I don't want to go live with these people I don't know. I don't see any, all these movies, Antoine Fishers and all this shit. I don't want to go with these people. That's it's not a right fit for me. This is outside my family. And she was like, well, all right, well, I'm going to get there. Just stay there for one day. Just stay there for one day, Dante. I said, all right, you'll come back tomorrow. And I uh, went there for one day. She didn't come back the next day. She didn't come back the next day. And she didn't come back for about two weeks. And I dropped off to these people's home and everything seemed all damn fine and dandy. And the next chapter happened where, you know, you realize that you're just a check. I'm somebody's check. You know, I, I, you wouldn't pay my auntie to take care of me, but you would pay these people to take care of me. You pay them damn good. And what I learned about being in the Department of Children Family Services is that the more problems that a child has, the more they get paid. So if I can get a kid to get on meds, I can show that he has aggression problems. I have to keep taking him to therapy. The family doesn't want him. The mother may not want him, et cetera, et cetera. He has so much trauma. They'll take that shit and run it to these people. Hey, he needs this, 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 this. So before I was at the age of what, 14, I was somebody's $4,000 $4, check a month. And I was only supposed to get 50 of that a month and I didn't see that. And I lived with these people and I, they would just feed me these hand-me-downs of kids that had been gone seven years. I'm wearing clothes that are down to my knees, going to junior high, not giving, you know, just all the things that you would think that a kid's supposed to have going into foster care, it wasn't happening. It's not happening what they're selling on TV. It's not that picket fence and the family thing that, that, they, that they propagate to the world about what foster care is, you know, it's, that shit doesn't happen. And um, the, the son that was there, we were getting to these beefs even with the family, I would have beefs with them and they would do shit like this. <laughs> they would have the family time in the living room where, you know, they go in there and watch movies, the whole family, whole entire family. And I would try to come out and sit with them and watch movies. And they would tell me, no, you can't be out here with our family. And I would say, why? You're a foster kid. You're not allowed to be out here with us. And it was just that simple, like just the emotion of just having a living thing. So it's like, you know, had this kid go back. So I went in the room and I would listen to on a crank up radio. Sit there and crank the radio and listen to music. Didn't have a TV in there. He had a game, but that was his game. You can't touch it. And um, one day, 
<laughs> it's another one day. Um, I came back from seeing my sister. We had our, our, our visits and stuff. And um, the wife and the husband had been arguing the day before and I had my foster sister and she was the truth. She was the truth from the beginning. I'm talking about this, this young lady was like, she stood up for everything. Like, you know, Tiffany Haddish tells her stories about being in foster care and how she stands up and you know, that charismatic stuff that she does. This was, this, this young lady was that. And I looked up to her and I seen the way she stood her ground to these people. The father, you little whore, you disrespectful little bitch. And he would just degrade this young chick. The son would go in there and get her her thongs and panties and shit out of her drawer. He would cut her panties and leave them on the bed, call her nasty bitches and stuff like that. You know, um, in the morning I would hear the way the dad, who was a, he was an ex-Laker player. <laughs> Funny shit, ex-Laker player lived in Bellflower. And he would just be going big on his wife. The same way that the son was talking to this girl, he was mirroring the way that his dad was talking to his mom. And the chick came in and she said, you know, I'm out of here, bro. I'm like, where you going? You gonna leave me? I, don't, I ain't gonna have nobody. She said, I gotta go. I gotta go, look at the way they treat us. I'm gonna pack my stuff. Don't let them run over you, baby boy. Don't let them run over you. And she's like, I'm about to go live with some rich white woman that's gonna give me my space. And like that, she was gone. I'm feeling here and I'm, I'm solo. And uh, we get into it, me and the son, we get into it. Cause I'm like, I'm about to press my line now. I'm doing what the sister told me, you know? I'm doing what their daughter led me to do. And I'm like, I'm doing this. And uh, I snapped one day, you know, I, I snapped. He had said something about my sister being a retard cause she has a disability. He called my sister a retard and he smacked me over the back with a broom. And I, I was going to Bellflower High at the time. And uh, I went to Woodshop. And I'm like, nah, I got to get you back. You're talking about my sister. You know what I'm saying? That's my weak spot. You talk, you smoke bad about my sister. And I went to Woodshop and I, I made a bat. And I formed this bat out of wood. And I put nails in the end of it. Like, you know, like you see on Warriors, the movie. I was like, all right, I'm about to do this. I got to teach him a lesson. You know what I'm saying? I, I got to get my lick back. I gotta make you stop talking about my family like this. That's my, that's my loved one that you, you spoke bad towards. And I left and the counselor called me in like, hey, you know, come in here. I'm like, what's going on? Like, what's going on with your foster family? I, I'm like, you know what's going on. I don't like these people. I hate them. They treat me like shit, but I can't go anywhere. And um, she said, uh, what do you have in your bag, Dante? I have nothing. Mind if I look in your bag or go ahead. So she looked in the bag and she pulled out my club. She's like, what's this for? And I'm, I'm sitting there looking at her. She's like, what's this for? She's like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell anybody. You know, that the confidentiality shit went out the window, I guess. You know, I'm not going to tell anybody. I said, you know, my, my foster brother hit me with a, with a broom. And uh, he talked bad about my sister. So I'm going to take this and I'm, I'm going to hit him with it. And she was just analyzing me, you know, psychoanalyzing me during these moments. Where are you going to hit him at? Oh, I'm not going to hit him in the head. I'm going to hit him in his back or in his leg because I don't want to kill him. I just want to hit him back for what he did. You know, I want him to, you know, understand. And she said, stay here. And she took my bag. And, uh, and I was like, can I go home now? She's like, nah, you're not going to go home. And I can hear sirens. What the fuck is this? I'm like, oh, fuck, they're coming to get me. So I tried to get up and run out. She's like, nah, they locked the doors on me. They dragged me back in the room. They're like, all right, some people want to talk to you now. So they had shut down the whole fucking school, turned on the fire alarms. They parked the ambulance right in front, brought the Garney in. They had sheriffs on either side, and they're sitting there with their hands on, right there in the holsters. Mr. Farmer, we just want you to lay down on this Garney. Everything's going to be all right. They lay me down on the Garney. They put the strap me down, strap my head down, put the things on me. Didn't go to Cerritos. Now I end up at Torrance Hospital. Stay there. Stayed there for about 14 days now. And a foster lady comes to see me, Miss Angela. Miss Angela was a cool lady. Got my first foster dog from this lady. You know, this is where all the dogs, she, I already love dogs, but I got my first foster dog. And I moved in there and they had my brother Fernando, my foster brother, my brother Jacob, and they had other brother Michael in the back. All these kids, trauma, child abuse. My first brother's, First foster brother, he was he came from El Salvador, just a baby abandoned in the street, came to America and was adopted. My brother Jacob, his father had on drugs, abused him, put his head in the toilet and stomped on it as a baby. And then Michael was just, he was, he was so far gone that he couldn't even talk. You know, he had a he had a thing on his side, whereas, you know, 
he had to digest food through a tube for the rest of his life, but just the happiest kids in that home. And I was the oldest kid that she brought in there for a while. She, you know, Dante, I usually don't bring kids, older kids. I try to keep these boys safe. And um, they had me there. The dad would, you know, he would take me and teach me how to do roofing, went fishing. You know, we, this was the American dream. I said, damn, fishing? We going camping, we in a camper. You know, we sitting down at the table eating home cooked meals. I was like, oh, this is, this is what's up, you know? And then their identity became my identity, which caused identity crisis within me. Because I believe this is where I was supposed to be at. This, this, this thing that you formed was so beautiful and so perfect that I forgot about home. And I started to say, I don't even want to go home anymore. I want to go home. Why would I go back to my mother? You know, why would I go back to the person that birthed me when I have all this? You know, it's a house. I lived in an apartment. I slept on a mattress in the living room. You know, why would I want to leave that when I have this? But who I was becoming caught up to me once again at school. Aggression, just exerting aggression. You know, only way I can compare of, of things to make it simple it's like when you get a you get a dog and that dog has been astray and he's been running wild and he doesn't have that that full fulfillment at a young age of socialization where he doesn't have the mother or he doesn't have other dogs around. They won't make eye contact. They don't know how to socialize. So they lash out. I in that stage of my life was that I was lacking socialization. So when kids would shoot the birds, they just talk shit. Oh, we do. Woo, woo, woo. I didn't know how to respond. You know, I was like, all right, do I shut down? I can't let you see me weak. So I will lash out and fight everybody fight. It didn't matter if you was a boy, if you was a girl, you said something crazy, we got to fight because I don't know how to talk. I haven't been taught how to, you know, shoot the stuff. And um, I got my dog. That was my only way of relieving stress and watching Animal Planet. At one point, I wanted to be a damn ASPCA cop. Um, and they brought another kid in and she's like, I'm going to give you a foster brother. And he shared a room with me. And I'm like, what's up, bro? And there's something about this dude that always rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, then my damn dog died. You know, he had, he had ticks and he had worms and they, they went and got rid of the dog while I was at school. You know, and I was fucked up about that. I couldn't even see him. You know, he just died. I was like, well, can I get another dog? And they're like, well, you got to do good in school now. Now you're hanging the school shit over my head. That's never going to happen. And I had this foster brother and um, he would always go home. And uh, he had a, a step grandfather. And I seen the privilege of what race would get you. He had a white grandfather. He was half white, half black, and his mother couldn't see him, but the grandfather could. And we would be in a room and he would say stuff and they'd be like, just watch out for your brother, you know, make sure he's cool. I'm like, all right. And he went, he went left with this dude one day and he came back. And when he came back, he came in the room and I noticed, like, hey man, did you pee on yourself? Like, don't get in the bed if you pee. Like, you know, just go in there and clean yourself, you know? And um, it was in his, on the backside, like a whole wet spot. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? He left and he came back again. And, you know, my foster mom, like, you know, get in there and take a bath. Boy, you don't be peeing on yourself. You know, it happens, you know. Traumatized kids do certain things. And it kept happening. And the third time he came in and I noticed it. And I was like, nah, it's something up. And I went in there and I told, I said, something was in my head. I said, I said, you know, Miss Angela, something going on with him. And, um. Uh, she went and told the people at the DCFS and they came and they stopped the, the boy from having visits with this dude. They were doing an investigation. And he came one day with a bat and he's banging on the foster mom door. These old people, oh, like 60, 70 years old, they retired. You know, their kids' kids are grown. And he showed up banging on the door, oh, older white dude, like, you wanna give me my, my, my foster son and I mean, my, my grandson, he's gonna be able to come with me and whoop, 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 whoop. And I asked him, I was like, man, what happened to you? I sat in there one night, like, no, bro, what happened? Like. Has he been touching you? Has he been doing something to you? Has he been doing something to your butt? And he, he melted and he, he said, yeah. And they stopped letting him go over there. And um, I was being just aggressive at school. So they took me out of the house and they moved me to, uh, to Compton, to Ms. Ms. Gloria Watts on Butler at Kelly Parks. Remember the name and all that. And, um, I was still going visits with him. And uh, my aggression at school got me kicked out. I was going visits with him. and. Uh, I came over for a home pass with this foster family one day and they uh, they said, you know, your brother wants to tell you something. And I go in there and I said, what's up, Nando? Talk to me, Fernando. 
He's like, I don't want to talk. I'm like, no, talk to me, Fernando. I'm your brother. And he always liked Xbox. He played the damn ATV Fury all day. And we're playing Xbox. And I said, you know, talk to me, little bro. And he said, you know, he would come in my room at night. What do you mean? Who? The dog? The boogeyman? What? You know, dad, dad always come in here checking on you. He said, no, he would come in my room at night and get in my bed and he would lay with me and he would hold me from the back. And uh, he would touch me and talk to me. And this dude was at school and I was like, you know, it's my brother right here. So it, it triggers. And it triggered, we were outside and they were barbecuing my foster mom and foster parents. And I was like, I, I want to come back home. And it triggered something in me. You know, it triggered, you know, the whoopings, you know, you, you, you've been tolerant enough to this shit. So he came out there and I was like, you know, what did you do this to my brother for? And they barbecue and they doing the family thing. And I'm like, nah, I'm gonna get it out of him. I'm gonna get it out of him. And he wouldn't admit it and he wouldn't admit it. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, all right. And I'm about what, 12, 12 at the time or something like that. And uh, I tied him to a, a post and I just started hitting him with a belt. Start hitting him. Start telling him, no, tell him, like, what's up, bro? What's, what's going on? Like, what's, what, what did you do? You know, what did you do to this kid? You know what I'm saying? What did you do to him? You just mirrored the same shit that this dude did to you to this kid. And you putting this baby through pain. I just, I just kept hitting him and I kept hitting him and I kept hitting him and I kept hitting him. In the midst of, you know, they, they creating a family barbecue and I kept hitting him and I kept hitting him. And they came and stopped me and they said, you know, he, what are you doing? And uh, at that point, you know, they drove me back. I never seen that lady ever again. They never allowed me to come over again. In fact, they, they got rid of him. They moved him out, then fucked around and, and uh, moved out of state. And I went through after foster home, foster home, foster home. Ended up in group homes in, in LA. Still trying to rekindle the relationship with my mother. At this point, the streets had had me. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm I'm living in LA, running down, running down Vernon with a machete, trying to fight dudes for, for talking bad about my sister. Anything was a trigger and the violence just kept rising and rising, even in, in the group homes. I would fight every single dude in the group home, um, getting into it with all, every single staff. It's like, I'm just a paycheck. I'm just a paycheck. I'm a $4,000 a month kid, you know, and, and they knew how to press my buttons. They're like, although you may have fought everybody in this group home as the, you know, the youngest guy, um, the lady told me one day, she said, I know why you act the way you act. I know why you do the stuff that you do. And she got in my face. She said, you act this way because your mama don't want you. She'll never want you. Who wants a kid like you? You ain't, you, you what are you? And I took that shit to heart so bad. It just made me go hard. I, I, I ran in the streets. I started running away. Ah, and it was, it was hard because my mom lived in, in the forties. She lived in the neighborhood forties on 46 in Vermont upstairs. I was in a group home in the H trade gangsters, and that automatically was a conflict. You're taking me home, dudes looking at me funny. I'm coming back, dudes looking at me funny, and I'm in this damn group home. So, you know, we show up to school. I'm going to Horseman. I got kicked out of there, throwing a damn chair at the teacher. I started smoking weed, just, just really running in the streets. I'm getting everybody in the group home high. The youngest dude, here, let's, you know, let's smoke some weed. Squall out back. Y'all want to gangbang? Let's go gangbang. You know, let's, let's, let's really get out here. And um, got kicked out of everything to the point at 12, my mom, I came home one day, I threatened her boyfriend. Um, I pulled a knife out on him. I threatened her boyfriend and uh, cause they, she was trying to whip my ass. He was trying to get in between. I thought he was trying to restrain me. So I started fighting him and I run in my room and I, I get my, you know, I get my field knife. You can buy him from anywhere. Just have one of the crackheads go get you one. Hey, go give me a knife. All right, little bro. I'm gonna buy you a couple two elevens. So, you know, when he got that, I got my knife now. I got nunchucks under my bed. That was another reason she kicked me out. Like, you, you, you're you carrying weapons under the bed and you're being disrespectful. And, you know, I find him, you're 12 years old, you in here drinking Hennessy. Uh, so I came home one night. All my shit was outside. My little bag that I had, it was in a Star Wars, a Star Wars overnight bag. And, you know, she left a note and said, you know, go back, go back to the foster home. You know, go, go back to the group home. I don't want you over here. So I ran away. And uh, but before that, I confronted the boyfriend and, you know, I had the local dudes of the neighborhood really, really press him and pressure him and get on his ass. 
You know, they, they fell for me. Like, that's the little boy that's always running the streets. He always out at night. He ain't never in the house. He just running wild. Uh, ran away while leaving school. I was going to Audubon. <laughs> and I could say I've never felt more unity within, you know, how do you say, the gang culture than I felt being in that, that area, you know, near the jungles and all that type of stuff. It's, it's, it's different over there, you know, it, it, it was different. Even the, the youngsters, they grow up different. You know, you, you hear them running around, you know, five time, five time, no cut, five time. You're like, what the fuck is this? You know, all of them know how to fight. They all know karate somehow. They all, they all knowledgeable. They all know about black this, black that, you know what I'm saying? And I'm stuck in the head like I know nothing about any of these. These are kids that know this shit. They all fighting, they slap boxing, they got the freshest clothes and all that type of stuff. And that's when I got a glimpse of the gang life. Like, this means something. Like, they, they have a meaning, there's, there's something there. And at Audubon, on that last day of school, I said, you know, I'm not, I'm not going back over there to the A-Trays. I'm not going over here to the 40s. I'm finna just run away. And I was just running away, running through the streets. I was at my uncle's house in the J's. I would sneak out when he's not there. His girlfriend, Puppet, you know what I'm saying? Puppet like, nah, you, you gotta go. You're making a spot hot. You know, we trying to make money over here. You're making a spot hot. So my mom found out where I was at, called the police on me. Like, you know, go and get him out the streets. You know, he's here. And they pick me up, they take me to 77th Division. DCFS has emergency people that they call to come pick up kids, and they took me to Linwood. And I lived there for about three days. She kicks me out, you know, my family member died, and I ended up back in Compton. Not only did I end up back in Compton, I ended up in a group home directly behind the house of where my family stayed, stayed at. Three houses down from that house behind the dude that I ended up falling up under and being his little homie was my auntie's house. So I'm like, oh, I'm home. I'm, I'm, I'm with my people. First day in a group home, I'm out the window. Second day in a group home, I established, man, you know, I'm with my family. This is where I'm at. Y'all can't tell me nothing. Curfew is nothing. Curfew is nothing. So now I'm starting to take on this institutional mindset of once I get here, I establish dominance. If there's anybody in this house that I need to have a problem with, if we can't hash it out, we gonna fight, you know, and it was one of those places I said they had the big house in, in, in Carson. They had the big house. They lived over there in the center views where, you know, they had a big house, fancy stuff. You know, they had three, four cars out front. These guys had the dapperest clothes and all that. You know what I'm saying? It's Carson. This is nice. You know, that y'all living good. You know, what was it? Moselle Pennington's group home. Yeah. The Pennington Foundation, they call it. And um, these guys lived good. They had weights, everything, three, four video games, you know. When I moved in, she just brought her daughter a brand new car. This old lady even had a money machine on her bed. You go in there, she counting money. So shit, you got eight kids, four times eight, 32 plus other house has eight, 32, 32, it's 32,000 from over here, 32,000 from over here a month? It's a fucking gold mine. I thought about robbing this old chick. I'm about to rob this lady. So our group home, roaches, holes in the wall. We got padlocks on the fucking refrigerators. After six o'clock, you can't go in the fridge. I can't get a juice, you know? And then you're taking meds and it's just crazy. It's just, I moved in there with my boy Dwayne and we just, we just hit the streets every day. We hit the streets and we just ran around smoking, drinking, partying. And now this, this neighborhood, I didn't know what it was years ago. This is like the heart of the east side of Compton, Lewis Park. Original Eastside Looters Park, which I came to find out later. I was I started banging a gang and didn't even know how to spell it. It took a dude in a holding tank one day. Said, "Man, you've been running around here tagging this everywhere." I'm like, "Yeah, remember I didn't really know how to read like that." So shit, some things I just didn't get. I'm it sounds out and uh, my boy Fatal, he's like, "Man, this is how you spell the hood." And um, going back to just in that neighborhood, the essence of it and. It wasn't the fellas that lured me in, it was the women. It was these young girls. You know, it was my first interaction with, with an actual just person from the hood. I done been around, you know, Crips and all that type of stuff, but it wasn't an intimate interaction where you're just talking to these people and you get to live with them and you get embraced. And it felt, a, it felt like a natural embrace when I met my homegirl, Lady Damu, and it was short little Creole thing. You know, curly hair, freckles on her face, but was a savage. I'm talking about this, this, She'd been stabbed by the T-flats, 
You know what I'm saying? Police know her by her name. Hey, Don Moo, she was, what's up, blood? She keep walking on you. all know who it is. And she already in gang file. You know, we we in stores taking stuff. You know, she taking pictures. You know, here, take the head of homie Kimon. Here, take pictures so I can send it to Mousy while he locked up in camp and in YA and stuff. And um, I would just watch her and I watched all the females. They was, they was fighters. And I said, yeah, that's when I became intrigued with this life. And I was walking down the street one day and, and just belling around and I met my homie Hancho. And we became best friends. And then I met Big Hancho. Then I met Swap Meat, you know, the, the, the locals. You know, these, these dudes is like legends. Like walking, talking legends. And it's like, damn, y'all embrace me. Y'all didn't even judge me. Y'all not looking at this group home van that y'all see me pulling up in. Y'all don't care about the padlocks on the refrigerators. Y'all like, man, come on over here. And they would feed me, you know. And a grandmother, may, may she rest in peace, you know. She would bring me in and she would give me assignments to make me feel worthwhile like I was part of a family. She would give me money and say, hey, go down there to Eddie's liquor store and tell him I need this, 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 baby. And I'd be like, all right. You know, I, and I felt a sense of pride about that. Or she would say, go pick up the kids and walk them from around the corner from, from, uh, from uh, the school. Go, go, over there to, go over there to Whaley, go to Roosevelt. Now, at this time in, in, in the city of Compton, it was, this was racial. It's been racial, but it's heavy racial. You know, Ludus Park and the Seven O's never got along. Lose Park and the T-Flats can never get along, will never get along, as long as you hitting up nigga killer on the wall. These are known facts. So I would have to go and get the kids, me, young man, get the kids, walk them, me and Lil Hancho, me and my best friend, we would walk them, and we would take the kids all the way home. Now, we gotta duck everybody. We gotta duck the mobs, we gotta duck the seven holes, we gotta duck whoever's across Compton Boulevard that's, that's coming over here, and um, we gotta duck this one particular individual who was, you know, he was riding around in a van and he was gunning at kids. He was gunning at kids. He was like, damn, like, this dude chased us. We chased him, right? Come on, we gotta go. He's chasing kids around. Like, what is this? It's, you know, later on, I will identify that as guerrilla warfare. You know what I'm saying? These are tactics that these dudes are taking out here in these streets to get at kids. I don't want the next, next lineage of these, these dudes to rise up, so let me nip this in the bud before it becomes more of a problem for me. And that's what I seen later. I understand it then. And um, when people speak about just, just the, the, the gang life and different cultures, being, I can't really speak for other neighborhoods or you know people that grew up and it was, being from Ludus Park taught me just geographics, going into Mingas High. If you cross on this side of the bridge of Compton Boulevard, you know what I'm saying? You a crip. That's where you, no matter what. If you cross this side of the bridge, okay. Then all that is bloods. All that is paru. So if I get caught slipping coming out the wrong gate, that's my ass. You know what I'm saying? If I, if I do this and then they're not asking, as long as they see you walking with this crowd over there, all right, we just gonna identify you as that. You know, that's, that's all it is. We don't need to ask you where you're from. As long as you stay over there and you associate with them people, then, you know, that's all we need. And I um, began getting into the gang life. I was never asked, hey, come get put on Looters Park. They was trying to force me away. Man, go to school, man. Go do this. Go do that. I was out late at night. It was my homie Skip that went and picked me up from Looters Park at 10 o'clock at night because I'm just standing outside, running around. And, you know, he, <laughs> he drove me home. Get up out these streets. He bought me my first pair of football cliques. He's told me, you know, you don't have to be a gang member to have money. You don't have to be a gang member to be a, a, you know, a gangster or, or be seen as this. But I seen them. I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be that, that, that big dude. You know what I'm saying? I want to be that dude with the tattoos that swole. Everybody respects. Everybody loves them. Everybody wants to be like them. You know, these dudes can cross the tracks and go to other dudes' neighborhoods and they respect them. I was like, damn, that's... That's what I want to be like. That's my black superhero. You know, they walk like me, talk like me, breathe like me, all that. I, I want to replicate that. And um, one day, you know, a, a dude named Too Swift, you know, that's, that's where I get my name from. A dude named Too Swift, one of the most hardest rappers that I, that underground of Compton that you'll ever hear. And um, he always had me around his family. He always, he always taught me things. He always took me under his, under, under his wing. You know, even, even when I was out doing stupid shit, like running around at night with guns, he'd come find me in the streets, man, give me this damn gun. You know, and then when I got to the point where I was actually holding guns, he, that, 
hey man, come here, man, what you got going on? Oh man, I walked up to, you know, my brother one day, I called him my bro, and I, I showed him a nine, just got a brand new P89 Ruger. Loaded and all that. I ain't even know how to pop the, the bullets out, put them back in, I ain't know how to cock it or nothing. All I knew was like, look, turn the safety off, put on some black gloves, and if shit gets sketchy, point and shoot. Didn't even know how to do any of the other stuff, you know. He looked at me, he seen it, he's like, all right, I'm gonna show you. Bam, he showed me, he did this, whoop, whoop, whoop. Showed the gun, then he looked at me, cleaned out the shells, you know, cleaned everything before he, before he gave it back. He took the clip. He said, nah, I'm gonna take this clip from you because you're gonna do something crazy out here. Even when it, you know, when it was wartime and I was outside with the other guns, it was, it was, it was always the individuals that was like, get out the streets, go to school. Even, you know, these dudes, mother, they mother, you know, all these dudes is brothers, might I add. Swap Meat, Honcho, Swift, Lil Loke, all of them, they brothers. And they mama would show up to school and be tripping on me. Like, you not my mama, why are you showing up to school tripping on me about not being in class? Because she just wanted me to do better. She actually cared. And that was the comparison of being in a group home and being in, in just out there in society. And, you know, their, their mom, she tried to take me in and even adopt me at one point. And uh, of course, all the shit that you got to go through with DCFS, they, they denied it. So I was like, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm street bound. So 12 years old, I'm walking up and down Compton Boulevard patrolling, no shirt on, red hat to the back, you know, not even red, burgundy. Burgundy to the back, you know, this is my homies, P-Funk. P-Funk, I'll funk or no funk at all. It's, it's, it's Paru, you know. I'm up and down the Boulevard, sniffing cocaine at 12, smoking Sherm, packs of Newports, you know what I'm saying? I got my packs in my sock. You know, I got my gun on me. If I ain't got my nine, I got my deuce deuce in my boot. And, and, and I'm out here patrolling. I'm willing to die for this. this is, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? From San Luis all the way around to the boulevard, all, all the way, these, all this territory, I'm, I'm running around. I'm tagging, I'm hitting up everything. And I was like, this is it for me. I'm, I'm, I'll die for this. This is what it's about. I'm loved here. This my family. Even though the people that you would think are the, the thugs and, you know, the, the gangsters, they was like, nah, man, get out the streets. Even my first love, who was their little sister, my first love, D. Dante, get out the streets. The streets is doing something to you. But it's, it, it took a toll on me. I was, what? You know, I'm, as much love as I'm getting from these dudes in the hood, it's still not feeling that void of losing my father, my stepfather, my grandma, my other grandma, my auntie, not having my mom there for me, not having a family there for me, all the support that I felt that I need. So it just went more. Add the drugs, add the feeling of power that I have with this pistol in my hand. I got a pistol. This is it's going to answer all the questions. We're going to get to the point. You know what, what you going to do? And I start doing shit in the streets. Um, whenever I couldn't find a gun, I just picked up a knife. You know, I realized where I got that shit from. I got that from, from seeing my stepdad stab my cousin for playing with him. That's where I get the term from before I even went to prison. You don't play with grown folks, they'll cut you. He was playing too much. So he had to get that respect restored. Let me stuck him in his arm, made him bleed. Yeah, you see blood now, you understand. Those are the, the mindsets. And um, I began to just start doing a bunch of robberies. I said, all right, I'm not in the group home and foster homes anymore. Um, whenever it was too late and I couldn't get inside Swift House, or I couldn't go down there to the dead end, to the blocks or the homies house or Kiwan house, I would just be running around just in the middle of the night doing robberies. Uh, I would rob people on the streets. You know, it, it just triggered, triggered, you know, this, this sense of power. I got money. You know, I'm a kid. I'm 13, 14. You know, like, all right, I'm a, money. I got, I got this much amount of money. I didn't care about the money. See, when you don't earn shit, you don't respect it. So I was taken, but it was just, it's just an adrenaline rush. So just robbery, robbery, robbery. It probably everything on the damn east side. When I was high off cocaine, I probably went around and did it. Just running around, just all right, I'm about to take this. I'm about to, I robbed the DVD man, the corn man, this person, that person. One night I'm out there with, with, with playing a knockout game so I can get some beer from, from Pisa dude. Just, just running around, just being a, a real tyrant, just doing crazy shit. I'm going all the way over here to the Kelly Parks. I'm in, in other dudes' neighborhoods. I'm not supposed to be in them over here in the South Side, Crips over there. I got a gun on me. You can't tell me nothing, you know? Even though, you know, this is a grown man game. These dudes out here play for keeps. You just, you doing this. And uh, time caught up with me just that fast. You know, robberies, fighting, uh, 
stealing dudes, guns out their front yard, jumping in people's backyards, beating up people, just just going over here doing shit. Even, you know, I got drew down on one night in the different lanes and, you know, they saved my life, you know, just being just impulsive as hell. And um, it caught up with me and I ended up going, I ended up going through the, uh, the ringer. Got caught two months after turning 13. DCFS said, you know, go ahead and take him. So I was turned over to uh, the probation department, Los Angeles County. Went through that whole trial just of everything that you can describe, you know, everything. Just imagine kids, kids after kids after kids in cages. They can't even get out to use the bathroom. There's no toilets in these cells, so they're pissing in corners, shit in corners. Some of them got hepatitis. It's blood and spit on the wall. They're pissing out of windows. Dudes are hanging themselves. You know, you, you see these things. Then I was kicked out of juvenile hall and sent to YA. YA, California Youth Authority, did more damage to more kids more trauma to more kids than I would say anything that prison can compare to. I'm talking about you, you wanna see teenagers, seven, eight at a time, gang bang, raping a guy, selling a guy. You know what I'm saying? Selling, this, this dude just got sold because, oh boy, this kid, big as hell, swole, knockout artist. You know what I'm saying? This dude hesitated for four seconds to show his impulse rate. Cause that's all why it is. They teach you impulse, jump at it. Every chance you get, you jump, you go, you fight, you don't show any. After four seconds, you don't do something to anybody, they drop you as a lame, you're a levi. They tell you, go find a daddy. You under somebody's arms, you somebody's bitch, essentially. And you gotta go through that. You get off the bus, they send you a list. I'm from Paru. I get to Preston, California, Youth Authority. I get off the bus, they send me a list. You gotta fight all these dudes and you better do it in 72 hours. Then the gang coordinators come. They bring me out. Look, we'll tell you this. You could say you're from Lutus Park, but you can't say you're from Paru here. Paru's don't walk the line. <laughs> oh, you know, we, we want to do this. You're trying to test my gangster. Man, I'm walking the line. Went out there, had a few fights with, with some dudes. Eye sliced open, nose fracture, you know, jaw swollen. Police don't know anything. Because they got one of theirs in there. You know, they got the biggest crip I ever seen at that age, working there, in the weight room, getting up. This is a staff. <laughs> he gets off the bench, big old blood killer on his back. Blood killer. And all the crips are surrounding him. I'm walking there. I fight him, 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 him. We do our thing, all right? You know, I didn't realize that up north we got beef. I didn't realize that they had all these alliances. So it was just continuous fighting and the cops couldn't figure out how this dude was fighting. And I end up in Paso Robles, uh, close that facility. I closed YTS, which is known as Gladiator School, where they, they had kids back there in back rooms tied up on five point spreads, locked behind, locked behind just door after door where you couldn't even hear anything. In cages, like these, these were dudes in cages and the cops hated us because we were tried as adults. Can't wait for you dudes to go to prison. We hate you motherfuckers. Y'all killed that later. Y'all killed that lady. You know, everybody knows the story about the lady that was killed in, in, in Youth Authority where they had a barbecue and the, the kid took her, killed her and threw her in a dumpster and locked her in a dumpster and went back in and went to sleep. Ever since that happened, since the 90s, oh, they hate every single person try as an adult. So for my 18th birthday, CDC granted me the gift and they transferred me over to Chino and I was to stay there in Madrone Hall where, you know, they got roaches flying in the room. There's no windows. Everything is busted out. And uh, I was uh, waiting to go to Pelican Bay. Just turned 18, waiting to go to Pelican Bay. And um, fortunately, I didn't end up there. They dumped me off in a, uh, well, they stopped in Tehachapi. <laughs> oh, we don't have no place for you here. And they sent me to uh, New Delano, you know, the, the super prison. <coughs> that's why I started my prison census of 17 years, two strikes. And that's where I learned my identity as a black man, my entire life, I didn't know what the fuck a black man was. Like you couldn't tell me what a black man. School only said that we were slaves. You know, they always said you wanna, you wanna keep something from a nigga, you hide it in a book. And I got in there with my, my, my OG named Skimp out of, out of Pacoima, a little short dude. Did all my tattoos on me, but he gave me a sense of understanding of who a black man was. And he had been in jail, he had been through YA, and he would put me on a hot seat every day, every time I fucked up. And he would have me draw. And even when I tried to fight him, because I tried to attack him one day and I jumped on him with a razor and he tat hit me with the tattoo gun, just ran me real fast. And, ah! He's like, oh yeah, make you melt like butter, don't it? You know, and I, I, I seen it and he said, well, you want to fight? Let's fight. Give me what you got. 
Level four, this dude had been in shit. Pelican Bay for 14 years and I tried to fight him. And he, he toyed with me so much, little dude. And I thought because I was bigger, I could get him. He toyed with me. He tied me up like a hog. Hog tied me, uh, uh, wrist to ankles. He set me on the floor and um, he set me on the floor. He put all the blankets on me, did all that type of stuff. And he left me there and he put his feet on top of me and he drunk ice. He said, when you're ready to talk, I'll untie you. Matter of fact, you untie yourself because you'll figure it out. And I panicked. Ugh, I got mad. Ugh. He's like, yeah, get it out. Get it out. Ugh. And I got it out and I, I, I stopped. I took a deep breath and I said, show me how to do it. And he showed me here, do this, do this, do this, breathe. And then he showed me how to work out. It was the men in prison that, that taught me how to shave, taught me how to do my hair, taught me how to read a lot of things, identified what a, what a black man was, how to respect other races and, and, and cars and entities and all that. And you know, it's, it's these men that I see that will never get out. They, they, they're never going to, some of them have become content. They've put in so much work over the years that he, all these new laws that everybody, oh, we passed these new laws and all that type of shit. They're just buried under the paperwork, sitting at the damn bottom. Dude's got seven of life, been sitting in jail for 30 years. All his family's dead. You know what I'm saying? His whole fucking family is dead. What does he have to go home to? Nothing. So he's like, I'd rather stay in here with them. Right now, if you ask me, would you rather go sit down with the president and, and eat a meal and, and pick his brain? Or would you rather go back in there and sit in a chow hall with these men? Which would you choose? Going back in there with the fellas. You'll never understand me. You'll never walk in my shoes. I'll provide some type of hope for them because that's all they ask. When you get out, go out there and live your best life. We don't want nothing. I went through a uh, hell of shit in there. I went through so much during that, during that time. Let's see, uh, <laughs> conspiracy to attempted murder on the police. End up fighting that. Um, in my last, last three years in prison. Well, let's, let's go to how I met my brother. This is <laughs> funniest thing. Let's go to how I met my brother, my brother, Brian James. We had, uh, ran across each other. We, we were on the shoe kick out yard in Old Corcoran. Um, you know, Old Corcoran has a reputation of being, you know, you're a big dog, you're going to be there. Pelican Bay, Old Corcoran, Calipat. You're a big dog, you're going to be there. And it's a shoe kick out yard. And um, they just had lifted the thing, let out all the guys that were indeterminate, and they were all in the yard. Um, and we were in a recycling crew, and we were picking up a bunch of shit, trash, and I noticed this dude, and I'm like, what's up, Lonely? That was his name. And we chilled, we talked, but we went on, went on about our business because we still got to respect these, these boundaries of different cars and different races. And I didn't really meet this man and sit down and talk to him until we got into this, this, this dog program. <laughs> and they brought me out of the shoe. A lady named Bonita Weaver, the captain there, sister, brought me out of the shoe. She said, I know you didn't try to, you weren't going to do anything to the staff. So I'm going to bring you out of the shoe. Won't you be in this dog program? And I had a choice to make. I could have went back over here with my big homie who had the whole entire yard sold up. Everything. You want it, he got it. You know what I'm saying? He's that guy. And he said, you want to do the dog program, little bro? I said, yeah, I'm going to do the dog program. I'm gonna go over there. I don't believe it's gonna come, but I'm gonna go. He said, you wanna leave all this? Phone, weed, this, that, the other. He, he, he popping, he like, here, you wanna leave this for that? And I told him, you know, I didn't choose to be your homie and move in here with you for everything that you got. I did it because you my homeboy and I learned so much shit from you. You know what I'm saying? You blessed me when I came here. You know, let me go over here and learn this and make this work. And, and I did uh, the Marley's Mutt's dog program where I met this, I met this, this astounding brother, you know, man running around, running around just, man, who is this white dude who's an essay? You know, who the, who the fuck is this dude right here rapping all this goddamn Tupac and all this shit? You know what I'm saying? And at the time, you know, he was cholo down. So my boy got the, he got the pants up to the navel, you know. I mean, who the fuck is this dude? And I met so many characters in this program that I never met before because it allowed us to leave the politics to the side. You know, it, it the staff left it alone. They let us do that. But it was the, the individuals that seen it for what it was that had been in prison for so long. And it was like, let these people have this, this joy. The Mexican mafia here, you know, the, 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 the Aryans, no, nah, we're we going to leave that alone. The BGS, no, nah, we get on the Bloods, the Crips, everything you could think of. They're all like, that's that. Let these men be who they are without the imminent threat of something happening for doing something wrong. Because all you wanna do in prison is be flawless. You don't wanna have none of that shit on you. You don't wanna have nothing on your record to say, oh, you're a buster, you're a, you're a chump, or you sold out, or you're a dope head and all that. So we were able to live 
and coexist in unison. And you've seen men grow. So you pay all these people this amount of money to do this, that, or the other, and all this type of shit, all these psychologists that can't solve anything or none of these type of things. And in the midst of this, it was a war going on. They were just dropping protective custody dudes off on the yard and the cops would do this. Hey, here's his paperwork. He's a snitch. He did this. He did that. And they have his pace and they'll plaster it at R and R. So all the inmates, you know, they're walking around, you know, it's predators. The sharks is out and they would see this shit. Oh, now we got to get this dude. So all the stuff that I was just, I was just observing like, damn, you know, this is, this is the real Willie Lynch that are going on right here. They building their infrastructure. They're keeping the money going because the more violence that you have, the more money we gonna have. So let's bring these protective custody dudes over here who fucked up over here on this yard. Let's drop them back off on a general population yard and let them have their way. And, and it happened. And in the midst of this, you had dogs creating peace. Dogs. A dog that was going to be put down, a dog that was on death row, that walked in the same fucking cage that we walked in back there in the shoe. Had that same pacing back and forth. You know, they asked, oh, why do you want to be a dog trainer? Because I understand them. They understand me. You know, we don't need to talk. We just got that vibe. We got that energy. We got that instinct. You know, some people have intellect. We got instinct. Dudes in prison have instinct. We, ooh, we feel it before we go outside. Something's going to happen. You know, we, we hear that we hear that mini 14 cock in the morning. It's a cold feeling to know that, you know, I moved the wrong way. I crossed that line. You can hit me with that same thing that goes in the AK from close range. And um, me and Brian met. I seen the struggles that he had. You know, some of his, his family members had passed. I seen that he really wanted to get to that, that, that level three. Brian James would not be out of prison if he had not sacrificed what he sacrificed, did those programs to get to that level three. He would still be in Corcoran right now. He would still be there because I went through it and we, we graduated. He left. I had to depart. I had to leave my brother. The dog program got snatched away from us. So dudes were running around. We were hurting. We took our babies. You know, you had dudes coming out, ain't seen dogs in 30 years. You know, that's how I met the leader of the, the ABs there. Walked up to this dude. Hey, let me see your dog. Man, what the fuck are you? you got a swastika on your head. Fuck you. Why would I talk to you? And he told me, like, you know, I thought I would die before I seen a dog again. So I gave him the dog. And they went over and you see grown men just. Glee with happiness. Boys again. You take them back. You give them that moment of peace. You know? And um, after the dogs left, you know, we were devastated. I spiraled back into the negativity. I got went full fledged. You know, they took all the dog, took all the dogs off the yard, took the big dog, my big homie, he gone. This shit is crazy. You know, I mean he told me, you know, I'm I'm lacing you. You know, who's gonna be there for the homies? These the homies. Who's gonna be here for the homies? I'm close to the house. I get caught up, <sighs> craziest moment ever. I got hit with a staff assault where an officer says that I broke his leg in seven different places, head butted him and punched him while in cuffs, shackled and all that after I just left the ICU from, you know, damn near dying. Six days in there shitting on myself, throwing up stuff, IVs everywhere, no liquid in me, poisoning myself from a botched surgery that I had in the prison. And um, I got fucked up, the staff, they, they put me back there and. I had to struggle for that last three years. I went to the shoe, COVID hit. I would rather watch men fight for their life with a knife in their hand than watch the way these dudes suffered. Coughing, hacking up blood, and it ain't like they gave you medical attention. Nah, they took us when we got sick. They drug us out of our cells. They took all our property. They put us in a fucking jumpsuit. If they didn't give you a jumpsuit, they put you in your boxers and some house shoes. They walked you to the shoe where it's perforated doors the same shoe where they had to pay for play in the 90s, where they had dudes fight to the death. Just that bad energy, that aura that was over this motherfucker, and they left us in there to die. Families don't know what you got going on, and the inmates didn't give the other inmates, they, they, we didn't give each other COVID, now y'all brought that in. You brought your sick ass into work to make extra money, and you got all of us sick. And you watch these dudes die. Dudes didn't even understand when they were going to go home. They had release dates. I was close to the house. I had four lawyers fighting a case over this officer down in, in Kings County. This weird racist ass shit they had going on down there where they told my lawyers who were four law professors. They said, this is Kings County. We get our we get our bread and butter out of those inmates. It's like shooting fish in a bucket. We don't care. We know he we know he didn't do it. We know he didn't do it. But we want a conviction. That's all that matters. We want a conviction. I'll take a polygraph test any day of the week to prove my innocence, but they wouldn't let me do it. Why? Because they want a conviction. 
And I went through the case and another blow hit me. You know, another blow hit me to where is I, I had to resort to violence while getting ready to go to a halfway house where one of my older homies, big, you know, he's a big dog, but you know, that, that fucking liquor, that liquor, that liquor do something to you, bring out a side. And he disrespected me to the point where he called me a bitch. He called me a fag. He said, you know, I can get you hit in any prison and yada, yada. He went all the way down the line and all these are violation, violation, violation. Don't nobody call you a bitch in prison. Don't nobody call you out this name. Don't nobody test your sexuality. Don't nobody tell you you're going to get touched. That's a threat. So I held it in. I held it in and I was like, I got, but I got to do something. I got to do, I got to do it because after this, the predator's going to come out. You let that slide. Now they're going to come and eat. No matter what, they, it's a level four. They're going to come and eat. I want to go home, but I still got to live here. This ain't over to the last seconds. And I went in there and I caught him slipping and I punched him, two pieced him. He went down. And one of his comrades tried to come get in and one of my homies got on him and he tried to get up and I'm telling him, man, watch out, you know, it's over. I just, I just had to get that out of my system. He wanted to fight some more. And I'm like, man, this, I hit him again. He real decent, man, I got to immobilize this dude. You know, while doing this, I'm thinking like, I got to get immobilized him. So I grabbed him and I put him in a rear naked chokehold, like real UFC in the middle of all this. Everybody's going off there shooting a non-lethal round, mini 14. And I got him and I'm choking him and he goes to sleep in my arms and I'm whispering to him, what do you run? Who do you run? You don't run shit. You gonna make me fuck up my life. You don't want me to go home. I thought you were saying it to him. I thought I was whispering, but I was yelling. And the homie that was over here fighting this dude, he's like, no. He said, don't let, let him go. Let him go. He's finished shoot. He got the mini, he's finished shoot, let him go. And he pulled me off of him and they were like, you know, they sprayed him down. They had already shot the other dude in the hand, broke his hand, bone came out from the mini, uh, from the non-lethal 44. And I let him go and he rolled over on his face and it was lifeless. I finna go home and I gotta do this to my folks. I thought we was homies. Why would you do this to me? Why would you force me to exert this? And he was there and he was sleeping. My life flashed before my son. I'm never getting out of jail. This dude ain't moving. I'm never getting out. This is over. This is over. You know, and I was like, they won. And at that moment, he inhaled and just started snoring and blood just started coming out everywhere. They kicked me off that yard. Actually, they kicked me off that yard after there was a riot. I was no longer allowed to go there. I had confidential just kites dropped. I ended up in Folsom with, with a young brother in the cell. We left from Corcoran. You know, and this, this is touchy for me, so I'm, 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 I'm going to go through this one. And this brother, they put us at odds. He's from Sacramento and I'm from Compton. And, you know, we both, we both may have been, you know, blood, power, and all that. But there's always a conflict. And it was always just, we never sat down. We would always talk. He would talk over here for his guys. I would talk for my guys, you know. And it was always, you know, don't, don't speak on Bompton. And we ain't going to speak on SAC. You know, y'all y'all stay like that. But the whole time, we were saying the same fucking thing. All we want is unity and peace. That's all we, we trying to go home. And they put us on the bus and we ended up in New Folsom together. We were in a cell together. And I got to know this man like, you know, I got to know him. I got to know this dude is my bro. And I stayed there and Folsom said, you know, we're going to kick you out. You don't deserve you. But Corkin's always sending us you guys up here. You know, you, you, you're not even supposed to be in this prison. You're supposed to be in another prison. They bumped you up a level higher. And I was in there with this dude named Baby Drugs. And this is my guy from Sacramento. And he said, we got to get out. We got to make it right in these streets. We got we to gotta do right for these kids. We got to make it right. We, we got to get out here. We got to fix our hand. We did a lot of fucking up. You know, he used to tell me about his son, you know. And he used to tell me how he wanted to, you know, I want to go give my life up to Allah, but I'm not, not quite sure. And we would all sit there. We would read. Man, we made plans. We sat down, did the business plan, the format, how to do this, how to get the LLC, how to do all that. Clothing line, rapping, music, you know, all that type of stuff. He got out before me living lavish, living his best life, united with his son, taking care of his mama, real pillar in the hood, you know? And this goes to show why, why, you know, we lose that time and we don't get it back. And we gotta cherish the ones we got. Let them people know. Let them know you love them. You know what I'm saying? Let them know you love them. If I died today, would you remember me tomorrow? That's the shit you gotta ask people. And that man ended up getting out I end up getting, I'm in the halfway house, we stand in touch, he plugged me in with so many people, community activists and all that type of stuff. And you know, a couple months ago, I get a call. They say, you know, drugs got killed. 
Ain't even been out here. And I broke down. I was in a dog park. I had all these dogs around me. And I broke down and I told Brian, I said, bro, they, 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 they killed Baby D. You know, they, they, they walked up on this man when he was in the sun, in the car with his son, and they killed this man in front of his kids. Nah, that ain't, that ain't, that ain't gangster. That ain't the code that, that, we, that, we are, that we are supposed to be up under. They don't do that shit. That's savagery. And I said, man, I, I want to get back in them streets. And I was like, man, I, I, want to, I want to talk to his son. I don't know what to tell his fucking son. Do I say, hey, bro, make it happen. Go ahead and get it back in blood. Or do I tell him what his dad would want? And that stay this course and stay this path. And I talked to this man and I, this 16 year old boy just lost his dad, just lost his dad two weeks. And I spoke to him and I said, you know, what do you want from the world? I said, I want for the kids to be safe. I want them to have their father and I want to heal. Now, if this kid can go through this, if, if Brian James can go through this, if all these, these people around here went going through the stuff they're going through, if my mama went through what she went through, my sister went through what she went through, all these wonderful pe people that have stories harder in their minds, if they're able to go through it, then who the fuck am I to sit up here and make an excuse of why I can't be the best image for somebody? So that's why I go in and I, the same program that liberated me, you know, the same people that came to visit me, they gave me a job to go in and teach kids. You know, and I'm able to, to, to talk to these kids like, you know, nobody else can talk to them because you ain't lived the life that they, that they lived. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you can't feel the way that they feel. You, they know when it's, there's, there's no passion. They know when there's no love. They know when they're just a paycheck, you know? Shit, this is, you want to sum it all up so we ain't even got to keep going forth with this. I'm, I'm, I'm what you call the product of the system. I'm the modern day slave who's been freed and put back into a world where it's completely strange and different. You know, look back how they did the slaves back then. You know, you're free. Go ahead. But you never gave them education, knowledge, understanding. You never gave them a platform to say, go ahead and live your best life and let me this. No, this you. Nah, it's here. You butt naked in these streets. Sink or swim. Pressure bus pipes. Do what you do. And you no, know, this is where I'm at with it. Just I got to. Do the best that I can. I got to keep on going. I got to get somebody watching. I've affected so many people in such a negative manner. You know what I'm saying? That now I ain't got no choice but to do right. Because at the end of the day, when I meet my maker, ain't no raft like that. And that's as simple as it is. Great talking, Captain. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.